very happy to have on the Goldstein on Geld show, Dr. Lawrence Reed, who is the president of the Foundation for Economic Freedom. And I discovered him because I recently read his book called Great Myths of the Great Depression, which I thought was a very timely book for me to read because it seems that so many of the ideas that were thrown around around the time of the Great Depression to improve the situation are being discussed today. So, Larry, tell me something. Are the ideas that applied then that got everyone out of the Great Depression good ideas for us today? Uh, actually, no. Uh, the prevailing thought back at that time, at least in the uh, halls of Washington was that government spending and government controls would get us out of the depression. But in fact, they prolonged the depression by uh, at least six or seven years. So I think the best way to get out of one, aside from avoiding the policies that produced them in the first place, is to uh, allow a sick economy to recover, to get off its back and not to burden it with additional uh, demands uh, in the way of government spending and taxes and regulations. But a lot of people say that those that spending was what really kind of launched the economy back into play. It put a lot of people back into work. It built bridges. And of course, they'll make the parallel to what happened after 2008 with a great deal of government spending. Well, if you if you observe, let's say, a, a man who goes door to door in a neighborhood and grabs all the money that he can get his hands on and then runs off to the local shopping mall and spends it, if you interviewed the shopkeepers there afterwards, they'd all say, yeah, he stimulated the economy. But of course, that raises the question, well, what would have happened had the money not been taken from those who earned it in the first place? You're not looking at the entire picture. And in the case of the Great Depression, yeah, there were government programs that seemed to put people to work, but they came at the expense of uh, the job creation, the enterprise, and the uh, new business formations that might have happened if government hadn't taken uh, the money in the first place. Uh, it, the fact is the depression didn't end as it should have in a very short order. It was prolonged by those kinds of policies. But didn't we see that people who were literally starving were then able to get some job, albeit on the government's payroll, and the people who were paying the taxes, well, I mean, frankly, Roosevelt would seem to have been trying to tax just the, uh, not the ultra-rich necessarily, but people who, who did have enough. Well, but he raised taxes across the board. In fact, most Americans didn't even pay income tax before Franklin Roosevelt, but by the time he was done, uh, most of us did. Uh, and not only did the rates go up on the uh, lower income people, but of course on higher income people, they went to the stratosphere as high as 91%. We really didn't get a substantial economic recovery until after World War II. A lot of people look at the fall in the unemployment rate during the war and say, well, We've, it, even if Roosevelt didn't get the economy moving, at least the war did. But the fact is, we, we uh, drafted 11 million men and sent them overseas, so they didn't count in the unemployment figures. But the real growth in the economy came after the war, when we got a massive reduction in federal spending and substantial reductions in, in uh, business income tax rates. Maybe explain to us something about how unemployment is measured, because even today I know this is a very, very difficult issue. People say, some people will say, well, unemployment is down, and others say, well, unemployment is is not down, it's just being hidden because of all the people who are discouraged workers. Uh, my two questions are, is A, was that the way it was calculated back then, and B, what does that really mean? The way the official unemployment figures are arrived at uh, has, has changed uh, quite a number of times over the years. And the way we calculate it today, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is not the same as it was calculated back then. Uh, politicians seem to find ways, especially in difficult times, to uh, define out of the labor market as many people as uh, many unemployed people as they can so that the official numbers look a little better. There's no question that if we included people who have given up on the search for jobs, uh, uh, the official rate would be much higher than it is today. It might even still be in double digits. And how can we know that? I've heard that that batted around quite a bit, but is there is there are there real numbers that we have, or is it just anecdotal evidence? A, a lot of it is anecdotal, uh, based on surveys. Uh, in fact, you may have noted that in my answer I said the the unemployment rate might be in double digits. We don't know exactly what it might be. Uh, there's a lot of guesswork involved in this too. So uh, I think it's more important to look at trends in the numbers as opposed to any particular number at any given time because there's a lot of fudge factor in the way they're calculated. 
We're speaking with Dr. Lawrence Reed, who wrote a book called Great Myths of the Great Depression. In fact, he's written a number of books. He's an expert in what happened around the times of, of, of Roosevelt, a little bit before my time. So I want to dive into this a little bit further, because growing up and going to school, Roosevelt was often seen as a champion of the poor. He developed policies. He developed Social Security and health care to help people out. He seemed like a good guy. And not only that, he was elected four times, which is more than anyone ever has been. <laughs> or will be again. So even though there are critics of his, it seems that the people at the time and for many, many years supported his policies. Were they just blinded or were they in fact, was there some merit to the policies? Oh, well, certainly in contrast to Herbert Hoover, who seemed to be cold and aloof, although he was just as interventionist as Roosevelt was in many respects, uh, Roosevelt did seem to be, um, you know, interested in the ordinary guy. He could be... Uh, mesmerizing as a speaker. He gave great fireside chats. And politicians are often judged more by their rhetoric than by uh, the actual outcomes of their policies. Now, Roosevelt's margin in the elections in which he ran for president uh, declined. Uh, uh, and then finally, of course, with the coming of World War II, there was a widespread sentiment that, hey, you know, you don't kick out the guy in charge at a time of crisis. So he, in that sense, uh, uh, you know, his last term was probably an easy one to get elected to. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't look so much at uh, real economics and actual outcomes of policies. We judge politicians more by, you know, do they seem to be a nice guy on my side? Uh, does he give a good speech? And in those days, uh, there was a great deal of loyalty to the commander in chief who seemed to be doing things, even if they weren't altogether working out. So the feeling that I'm getting from you is that a lot of the policies of Roosevelt were not what solved the problem. So what did actually get the U.S. out of the Great Depression? Was it the war? Well, uh, there is a widespread belief that the war did that for us. But I, I think that we should be careful with that because war is not an answer to depression. It diverts resources. Um, and in that sense, it actually uh, it may set us back. It's true that unemployment rates fell, as I mentioned, that was in part because we drafted 11 million men. Um, but because we had to win the war effort, uh, we were not making things like refrigerators and automobiles and consumer items. We were diverting resources to the production of planes and, and bombs and tanks. Now, we had to do that, arguably, to win the war, but I wouldn't confuse that with economic recovery. That didn't come until we drastically reduced government spending after the war and, uh, and also reduced business income tax rates. In 1945, uh, Roosevelt's successor, Harry Truman, signed into law a reduction in the top income tax rate for businesses from 90% to 38 overnight. And that was a big reason for the burst in investment uh, after the war. The problem with economists, with all due respect, is that they're they're only able to test one sample of what happened, which is what happened. They can't go back and say, well, let's redo the Great Depression, and this time we'll have uh, low government intervention and low taxes. But can you give me similar periods, or there examples maybe we could look at, where the government really did have a hands-off approach, and the, the Depression was just a little blip instead of a long-term uh, uh, multi-decade problem? Yeah, I'd be happy to. In fact, the example I give you occurred only eight years before the Great Depression started, and that was in 1921. We had a very sharp, uh, deep uh, depression, but we hardly remember it today because it was over with in eight months. The reason uh, that it was over with so quickly is that the federal government did what it ought to do facing such a situation. It drastically reduced its spending. Uh, it reduced tax rates. It backed off an economy. It didn't bail out businesses. It didn't prolong the depression. Uh, it, and it was over very quickly. Uh, James Grant, uh, a, a, very, uh, a very good economist, has recently written a book about this called The Forgotten Depression. And he makes this very point. We did the right thing in 21, and it was over with in no time at all. Okay. So if we wanted to maybe set some examples or 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 set some policy today, because frankly, I think we're dealing with a tricky situation, given the fact that there are the, the Paul Krugmans of the world who are saying that the reason that uh, we got out of the, the 2008 crash was because we printed money and we lowered interest rates to basically zero. And as long as we keep it that, 
that low and continue to borrow, we'll be able to continue to stimulate the economy. And look, look at the stock market. Look how great things are. Why is that wrong? And wh how can we convince people that, that maybe they need to be a little more responsible? Well, these kinds of policies often look good in the, in the near term. And really, in, uh, it's only been, what, seven years, uh, six or eight years since uh, the beginning of the last recession. Uh, that's a drop in the bucket. 20 or 30 years from now, we may look back and say, what we thought seemed to be a good idea uh, to recover from that, to, that recession, printing a lot of money, actually had long run and very uh, dire consequences. So I wouldn't judge the printing of so much money in uh, the last few years uh, by its immediate results, I would tend to look at uh, what it's likely to produce in the long run. And there, I think there's, there's good reason to be concerned. I don't think this is a sustainable policy. And uh, we may see at some point uh, the chickens come home to roost and the full effects of it uh, will not be nice. <laughs> but of course, at that point, all of the politicians who put it into play will have long retired uh, with the pensions yeah. that are being paid for by uh, by. Yours and my children. Larry, we are just about out of time, but I know that you explain things very well about the economy, and I'd like to encourage people to learn more about the work that you're doing. So how can people follow you and follow your work? Well, thank you, Doug. I would encourage your listeners to give our website a look. It's FEE, F-E-E, -E, which stands for Foundation for Economic Education, FEE.org. Uh, lots of fresh content every weekday, uh, 70 years of archived material easily searchable, uh, and very relevant. It's one of the top websites uh, in economics in the world. Okay, so we will put a link to that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. Dr. Larry Reed, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Doug. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.